So once again, we're taking a short break from our main series in Luke and dipping back into Philippians. The letter of Philippians is like a multifaceted diamond. When we, when we look at it from afar, we see the big picture, which is all about living as citizens of a heavenly colony. And when you start turning it from side to side, it creates a new dazzling display of color and light. And with each turn of the page, of this letter we are confronted with a new sparkle of gospel life and today's sparkle we see uh, well, t- and t- the sparkle we see today when we read this passage is joy which may seem a little bit odd to us especially since the circumstances Paul finds himself in doesn't really jump out to be joyful does it at least from a worldly, worldly perspective that is However, Paul is still full of joy, and that's because Paul's joy is built on a firmer foundation than the treasures and pleasures of this world. Paul's joy is fixed in Jesus. So let me start with a question. What makes us joyful? And how do we live a life full of joy? We humans have a real infatuation with the pursuit of um, in the pursuit of joy when I was preparing the sermon I was sitting on a train and the guy next to me had this big book it was about this thick it was um, it was from the Dalai Lama uh, how to live a life full of joy I was really really tempted to have a conversation with him but um, I didn't feel like nipping it's like boy but anyway I get distracted yeah so you can see much ink has been spilled over the decades from religious leaders and spiritual gurus like the Dalai Lama to clever marketing campaigns. You know, the world is clever on these things, telling us what we need or what we need to do in order to find happiness. And underpinning this worldview of joy is the instinct to maximize our own pleasure by minimizing our pain. Because for the world out there, joy is rooted in the treasures and pleasures of what this fallen world has to offer and you know most of the time the focus isn't really on the big things the focus is on the little things we do you know what we look forward to when we come back from a hard day's work what we eat what we drink what we wear basically everything that we are we like to spend our time and money on and this may sound like wisdom however I think it's utter foolishness whenever we maximize our own pleasure it will always be at the expense of someone else. So instead of joy, we are daily confronted with the worries and stresses that feel very real and overwhelming. Our daily lives feel more like the chaos water of decreation flooding in, a breaking down of all the boundaries of order in our life, a stormy sea of doubt, pain, fear and death is hanging on us like a wet clothes weighing us down and we are at serious risk of drowning so how can we find joy when life comes at us with all its brokenness we all know how what it feels like to believe that the treasures and pleasures of this world can bring us joy or at least distract us from our own difficulties and then afterwards we are left feeling disappointed and empty Take, take our favorite escapism, for example, binging on TV programs. We can diligently invest an enormous amount of time, and I speak out of for myself, enormous amount of time on a program. And then when we finally get to the end, we are, fe- we are left feeling emptier than we started. And our troubles are still there, and they are very real, and they've not been dealt with. Or we can think about our dream holiday, you know, that thing we've been looking for for at least a year because it's usually annual holidays. Uh, But when that's finished, the harsh realities of life are still there and we have to come back to that. And then we go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Nothing really satisfying us. Nothing really making us happy. Paul is facing something far worse than our daily troubles and yet he has found joy how how he was imprisoned chained up waiting to be judged the judge himself 
was a sinful, broken man. And you know what? That does not fill me with any confidence at all. He's very life hanging in the balance. Death, fear, pain, worry was all around him. He must have felt like the chaos waters of disorder splashing against him, just waiting for that final wave to swallow him whole. But even in a time like this, the apostle is filled with joy. He sees what has, what has happened to him, what is happening to him, and what's going to happen to him as something good. We see that in verse 12, 18, and 19. Verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Verse, 19, uh, verse 18, only in every way where the pretense or truth Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And verse 19, for I know that through the prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. We are confronted with the past, the present and the future and the first thing we notice is that Paul's joy is not influenced by the comforts of what this world has to offer Paul does not have a Babylonian view of joy in mind no his joy is rooted in the past and is always looking to the future his joy is held in Jesus for he is sure that Jesus who started the good work in the past in him will bring it to completion into the future that's great great news for us all he wants us to see that if we are in Christ our own story is mapped on to Jesus story let, the, let me just let that sink in for a second Jesus story is our story his life his death and his resurrection through his life he gives um, through his life given to us he gives us his life um, Jesus knows that we cannot do life by ourselves the messiness is far too much for us but you know what it's not too much for him through his death he bears that God forsaking punishment that we could not bear he downs the cup of judgment down to the very last drop and in his resurrection he proclaims death is dead all things will be made new this is the joy that a citizen of heaven knows to be true and is called to live like in Jesus our joy has been secured and we have nothing to fear for we know he is risen and he will come again Paul lived out this reality and it impacted the way he saw life and the way he lived life. We're going to look at how Paul views the things that happened to him in the past, what is happening to him in the present and what is going to happen to him in the future. And as we walk through these sections, my prayer is that we would be filled with comfort um, that Jesus is in control. He's in control of our past. He's in control of our daily messed up lives and he's in control of our future. And as we read this, I would like us to also be challenged to know that Jesus is in control. So we are called to live like he is in control. So let me start with the past. In verse 12, we read, Paul, uh, in verse 12, Paul wants to assure the brothers that what has happened to him in the past has really served for the advancement of the gospel. So what did happen to him? As a quick overview, he was falsely accused um, in Jerusalem and then almost killed by a Jewish mob. He escaped the mob only to land in the hands of the Romans, where he escaped flogging by revealing himself as a Roman citizen. He remained in prison, narrowly escaping a plot to kill him, he was then shipped off to Rome, almost drowned, and then entered Rome as a condemned man, where he was bound and kept in chains. We would have forgiven Paul if he was to look towards heaven and ask the question, why God? Why has this happened to me? But instead, 
Paul looks back at what has happened to him in the past and sees that even these bad circumstances, and they were bad, they were really bad, have been overruled by God and has served for the advancement of the gospel. Paul is probably thinking of Joseph um, when he was sold into slavery back in and landed up in Egypt. Just like back then, he knows there is a past bigger than his own personal past. A past in which Jesus has showed his faithfulness to the church. When Jesus overruled the, when Jesus overruled the bad circumstances in Joseph's life to save Israel. Paul is not thrown into the depths of despair because of his past. His life is grafted into Jesus' life, death and resurrection. His joy is rooted in Christ. And as such, his foundation is solid and cannot be moved. Instead, he sees how Jesus' Jesus's mission, the mission of blessing all the peoples of the world, is now, even in these circumstances, being worked out. The ordeal has brought him to Rome. Yes, he is chained up. Yes, he's handcuffed and escorted all day with an armed guard. But this literally gave him a captive audience. And I think Paul would have seen it like that. As he was living his Christian life, talking to the guards, having church family coming to visit him, the radical and practical life of the gospel being shared and held in common, would have left its mark on the guards, thinking back on lo last time we were in Philippians, the mark of the gospel. What is the mark that we are leaving? Well, Paul would have left his mark because he would have preached Christ. That is the same for us today. When we live the total radical and practical life of church, it will be simultaneously seen as attractive and rejected by the world. But we are called to live as citizens of heaven bleeding light all over the place and then being filled up on Sundays by Jesus, being fed and being washed. When Paul looks back, he can see how Jesus has overruled sin, death and the devil in order to accomplish his will and purposes. This comforts him and, and it should comfort us and bring us much joy as we look back at our own past and the past of our family, church family, to see how God's hand has been directing all of us to fulfill that great mission of blessing all the peoples of the world, even here in Halifax, in North Halifax, where we are, where we've been called. And more can be said about how his actions and his circumstances bolden the church in speech, filling them with confidence and zeal to proclaim the good news of Jesus without fear. But as we step into the present, fear is the thing that clings to us. Looking back into the past, we have the comfort of knowing it is done. And everything that is done is much easier than what is happening in the present. We always see the present troubles as greater than our past selves and our future selves. And we even see them as greater than our other people's troubles. And that's because we are scared, scared of, dealing, scared of dealing with it and scared about what will happen. And we don't always believe that Jesus is in control. Or even if we do believe or say that Jesus is in control, do we live like it? We are incredibly self-focused. We care more about the present self than even the past self or, the, or our future selves. What really matters is that there is the year and the now. And if the year and the now is not going well, how can we be full of joy? Well, Paul's present was not going well. He was in prison and he was facing heartache from within the church. Although many of the brothers were encouraged and boldened, in verse 13 we read, uh, 15 we read, we have some that started to preach the gospel out of envy and rivalry. Being slandered by those outside is much more bearable or tolerable than being slandered from the church family within. It is important to see 
how Paul handles this situation. He has no personal pride at all. He realizes that these misguided brothers were not preaching a heresy. They were preaching Christ, even if their motives were mixed with selfish ambition. Because Jesus is preached, it fills him with joy, even though the brothers are accusing him, um, well, even though the brothers are causing him harm and heartache. Paul cares more about Jesus' name and the souls of others than himself. We need to carefully study how Paul behaved. His life and his reputation were of no concern at all so long as the gospel of Jesus was being advanced. He seeks unity, not division. Now the obvious application for us is, if a church pre preaches Jesus, it doesn't matter what they think of us. We rejoice with them, for they preach Christ. Which can be especially challenging um, for us in our own evangelical context, with thousands of many branches yet we need to imitate Paul and move away from prideful retaliate retaliation and seek gospel unity the not so obvious application as we look back into this situation is it is hard it is hard for us to understand how Christians could fail to love the apostle and that's because we see him at arm's length we see him from a safe distance full of admiration at how he poured out his life for Jesus however in his day his challenges could not be kept at arm's length in the way we that we might be able to do now when Paul visited church or wrote to them his great love for Jesus and for, for the people meant he was not prepared to be silent and passive when he saw compromise, sin or division. Paul exposes, exposed the darkness in church, churches and through both his life and his teaching drove Christians to live as citizens of heaven through faithful service, bold witness and an unspeakable joy in fellowship with Jesus by the Holy Spirit in the church. Which meant some would have loved him, others would have rejected him as he destroyed their comfort zones and their hypocrisies. Which reminded me a bit of the parable of the sower. When the thorns are exposed in our soil, are we prepared and willing to pull them out? Or are we just hardening our hearts, allowing them to come and choke the word? This has been especially challenging for me as I looked at my own life and asked the question, what are the things that is important to me? Is it the gospel? Is it Jesus? Or do I see comforts of this world? Am I really plugged into church life, grafted into the body of Christ, serving and receiving the life of Jesus? In other words, am I living as if Jesus is everything to me? And that is a question that we all have to ask ourselves daily. The snares of the world are many. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. We have to guard our hearts, minds and attitudes to what really gives us joy. Paul is full of, jo full of joy even when harmed by divisive brothers, even when in prison. He knows such joy because Jesus is everything to him that is the great truth that we learn from Paul whether difficulties or opposition whether misunderstandings and heartache we can not only endure life but live life with great joy if we set aside our personal life and accept 
the life of Jesus as our true life. It's not easy, but it is simple. Our con constant tendency as fallen human beings is to assume that giving ourselves to Jesus will be bad for us. We constantly assume that we will be at our happiest and most fulfilled if we look after our own interests. We are falling into the same old lie that the devil told Adam and Eve in the garden. I always get the garden in. Always, you guys know this. That's the suggestion. That suggestion that Jesus was keeping true joy from them. They learned the hard way that the life of Jesus is true life and joy and fulfillment and freedom. And that is the same truth that Paul now clings to. Even freedom from the fear of death. Verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As we now look to the future, we realize that Paul's future was rather bleak in human perspectives. Death was at his door, ready to devour him. He could be sentenced at any moment, and he did not know if he would live or die. Now, death is a reality for all of us, unless the Lord comes before that time. It was never supposed to be, but it is a, mortality is a vivid reminder of the reality that we are cut off from God that we have rejected the fountain of life, that we have dug our own broken cisterns, and they are polluted. When Jesus saw his friend Lazarus died, he cried. He was so deeply affected that it even brought him to tears because he knows that death is an intrusion. It was not meant to be. Paul himself writes in chapter 2 how Epaphroditus a beloved church member sent by the Philippian church almost died but the Lord saved him and in so saved Paul from great sorrow in the biblical view joy and sorrow are not mutually exclusive <clears throat> are not mutually exclusive we can have joy in and despite of sorrow because of the resurrection. Let me say that again. Joy and sorrow are not mutually exclusive. We can have joy in and despite of sorrow because of the resurrection. Unlike the world, world's view of maximizing pleasure by reducing pain and suffering, as a Christian we know that the appropriate response to death is sorrow. However, we are not paralyzed by the fear of death. Although we see the endless stream of humanity disappearing into the abyss of death, we are com comforted and reassured that one man has stepped back out of the abyss, never to go back into it again. Jesus uses death to kill the old humanity on the cross so that the new humanity can be birthed in his resurrection. Christ is raised up as the first fruits, a forerunner, a pioneer of new creation, of immortal, immortality. But we will also get our turn. Therefore, Paul can say in verse 23 that his desire is to depart and be with the Lord Jesus, which is far better. However, as always, Paul does not put his own interests first. He feels he must remain a little longer in the body for the benefit of the church. Paul's attitude seems so far from the worldliness that so easily seeps into our own hearts and minds. When we think of what we most want, how many of us would say with Paul to die and to be with Jesus? And what I mean with that is not just to flee from this world, but to die to one's own self, being grafted into Jesus' body, the church, and by so doing, partaking in the unspeakable joy and fellowship with Jesus by the Spirit and in his church. We have followed Paul contemplating his own past, 
present and future and looking at it we saw how Paul saw his own story as part of Jesus' story and with that we saw how his joy is grounded in and connected to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus as we come to a close I want us to look at how Paul sums up how we live a life of joy for him joy was part, being part of Jesus being a citizen of heaven and his great concern was how the church conducted itself because what we do and what we say really matters it matters in what we think joy is and it matters in how we experience joy if we are in Christ we have his joy but uh, his joy but the way we conduct ourselves will impact the way we experience this joy Paul sums it up beautifully in verses 27 and 28 after looking at himself the focus turns to the church after contemplating his own future in verse 21 and 20 he seems to hold up his finger and speak directly to the church about what their future needs to look like whether Paul manages to visit them again or is kept in prison, the most important thing for the Philippian church is that they live worthy, stand firm and be united. Now I'm going to paraphrase Paul's verses in 28 and 28 as I come to a close. <laughs> the future I desire for you is that you live worthy of the gospel. Whether I am present or absent, I look for the same news that you are standing firm under attack but remember that standing firm under attack while, requir while requiring while requires stern steadfastness on the part of the individual it's a corporate matter an activity in fellowship this steadfastness requires your unity your single-mindedness in Jesus together battling for the faith you hold in common church family the exhortation is that we exercise our heavenly citizenship worthy of the gospel of Christ which leads to unspeakable joy in fellowship with Jesus by his spirit and in the church in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen, Amen.